now with the, mar the marijuana addicts who call and tell me it's safer than alcohol. I don't want to hear that. Don't, don't, I, I, I don't want to hear those stories. Idiot responses I'm not interested in. So I watch the first disc. I see my father in his store in New York. And I look at him and I say, holy God, that's not the man that I carry around in my head. When I see him as a young man, he was younger there than I am now. I see a different man that I imagine in my head that I often talk about. He was not really that gruff. He was a nice man. It was probably my fault that he was gruff. I probably provoked it in him. I'm starting to look back. I think I caused all the trouble just by being a hard-headed guy myself. And I didn't want to listen to him. Even if he was right, I wouldn't listen to him because that's the kind of person I am. And that's the kind of person I am today. Yes, maybe I make mistakes, but we all do. And I'm still fundamentally the same person I've always been, which is I don't want a government telling me what I can think, what I can eat, what I can breathe. I don't want a Black Lives Matter le lecturing me on what I should think and what I shouldn't think. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I know what's real. I know what's false. And that's one man's opinion. And that's what makes for a radio talk show. And so if you care to join the conversation on this, I think, fundamental issue, the one we're talking about today, which is the 60s or late 60s, if many of you were around then, or even at another time in your life when you're a free spirit, and then you changed into a political conservative or you called yourself a, a fiscal conservative, what actually happened uh, that made that made you do that? And by, by the way, I also played in the last hour my opening from September 11, 2001, and I listened to it very carefully, and I'm still, you know what? I agree with every word I said. I liked it. And so I'll ask um, Doug in Oregon to send it over to Art Moore of WorldNet Daily from my uh, michaelsavage.com website, and I want to put it up on the site for all the world to hear. I think we have it up anyway, S Savage on September 11, 2001, and I think it's a YouTube, but I want to put it up on my, uh, on my website for you to listen to. And now I'll take your calls uh, on this incredible issue. And I have a big weekend ahead of me, not only looking at the Savage Family Home movies, 1967 to 1985, with all of the bad jump cuts and the light flashes and the double exposures, all of us trying to become a D.A. Pennebacher at the time. Anyone who had a little camera in his hand was uh, allegedly on the way to Hollywood. And some actually went to Hollywood from those days with those little movie cameras. Uh, it's going to be, be quite an entertainment. I also have a big weekend of car stuff. One of my favorite shows on TV is car, our car shows at night. I like to watch these car shows. I like to watch the repair of cars. I like to see how they take old cars and repair them. I love people who can actually fix things and rebuild engines and re-chrome things. And it, re it relaxes me. It's just something beautiful. So this weekend, I have uh, my friend Gary, the mechanic, coming out to look at my 1970 Jaguar XKE, which has a little bit of a hiccup somewhere. And the 1961 new purchase, 1961 XK 150 drop head coupe, a show car, unbelievably beautiful. And I want to, there's a few little things I have to have done. None of them are need to be restored in any way. So it's a little car fun. And then uh, that's it. That's it. So that's life. Life goes on. And we sit and we watch the world go by. And I'd like to have your calls now on the Savage Nation. Let's begin with Steve on WFT. You can phone. Let's move on. Patty on WMAL, line eight. You're on the Savage Nation. What's your story? Go ahead, Patty. I can relate to you. You hear me, right? Because I heard it. Uh, yes, I can relate to you, Michael, very, very much. When I graduated from undergraduate school in the um, middle to late 60s, uh, I was going to be a social worker and save the world, because uh, I knew what was best for everybody, of course, liberal right. that I was, young that I was, got a job for the county in Virginia, became a social worker, and oh my goodness, had such a rude awakening, um, found out how the clients manipulated the system, found out how the staff manipulated hey the are you sure you're not my spiritual sister no i'm not sure at all a lot of the things that you say to me i'm like oh my god i i uh, you know I well we have a, we have a parallel life in that i became a social worker because i was a a wide-eyed uh, do-gooder i wanted to save the world and do good i was a good kid and then i saw how they were manipulating the welfare system i got sick yes and, and I walked out of there, uh, walked in, a flaming liberal walked out, a Reagan conservative. <laughs> 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 
Well, that wasn't my total conversion. It was later on after I worked for a PhD when my lying liberal professors all told me, well, you know, you've written six books and you've got two degrees and they're really good, but you can't be a professor till you get your PhD, which is a union card. And so I got my PhD from a great university and I really got a, a, a really f fine PhD from a great university, published my dissertation as a book. And then they said, sorry, white males need not apply. I would say that had a caustic effect on my, on my evolution. I would say that was the final uh, evidence I needed as to what a perverse society actually looks like. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had... I'm not, hey, I'm not complaining. By the way, I'm not complaining. I'll tell you why. Although the road was very hard, very hard indeed, it drove me into areas I never would have gone into. I would have just been another lazy professor collecting tenure, spewing anti-American rubbish, uh, and getting away with murder, uh, collecting a big fat check and saying America's no good probably. I would have been stuck. So God actually dealt me a good card. I didn't know it at the time. It was all God's, I was all God's in God's hands. It's because of that, what was done to me by the ACLU and the vermin on the left, that I wound up in radio. I had a fight to find a way to express myself and I did so, and I got very, very lucky. And here I am, 21 years later in radio, and I have an audience any 15 minutes, an AQH, larger than all the audiences of all the professors in America probably in their entire life. Think about that. Just think about that. Thank you for the call. That's how big the audience is on radio. People don't know that. We all look at ratings of Fox News and the numbers and the average quarter hour. It's bigger on radio. Did you know that? Radio has larger audiences than television. I don't think people understand that. I think people tend to dismiss this medium as old-fashioned and uh, un not influential. It is the most influential of all mediums. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Oh, hold it, hold it, hold it. Stop the music. Wait a minute. I started to tell you I thought I met Jimi Hendrix. I got distracted after he was dead. Jimmy Hendrix died a long time ago, but I told you this story, I don't know, four years ago? I was crossing the Amocadero in San Francisco when one of these homicidal, psychotic pieces of garbage bicyclists of the type that was just arrested finally with the handlebar mustache, he's vermin on bicycles. And I ride a bicycle, but they're criminals. These are gangs. They're punk gangsters. They're afraid of people. They gang up on that woman. Anyway, one of them is speeding down the Embarcadero the wrong way. I look to the left. He comes at me from the right and almost kills me. Much younger guy, muscular, and a real piece of garbage looking for a fight. And I say, what? I scream at him. I instinctually don't think. I react. That was my mistake. He gets off his bicycle and takes off a bicycle lock or a bicycle chain. And he's walking towards me. I had no weapon with me. And I saw it was a very bad situation. And as God is my witness, out of nowhere, across the Embarcadero, comes a dead ringer for Jimi Hendrix, as he would look at that time, gray-haired, slight gray beard, like a twin for Jimi Hendrix. And he got between us and he said, hey, brothers, peace, something like that. He completely diffused the situation. The moron on the bicycle got back on, glowering at him, uh, but... You know, this guy was afraid of this Jimi Hendrix ghost, I think. He wasn't afraid of me. And rode away. And I tried to talk to him, and he just waved to me and left. It's a true story. It happened. Was it Jimi Hendrix's ghost? Was it just a man on the Embarcadero? Was it that fellow who just called in the last hour who said he was a guru? I don't know who it was. But I do know that uh, there are angels, and I, don't, I know that there are devils on the earth. And I'll tell you another story. That's from Real Life 101, but I've got 30 seconds to do it. But I'll give you a lead in. You know I spent many years in the islands, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, Tahiti, collecting medicinal plants. And my collections are stored in seven principal museums around the world. Well, <clears throat> last night I went to a little spaghetti joint here in Marin County. Across from me are four Fijian people. No one would know they're Fijian, but people who've lived in Fiji. I recognize them as Fijian. Others would say nice black people, but they were Fijian. So I spoke to them in Fijian. I started with the Nisambula, and let me tell you what happened about spirituality. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. 9-11 edition. 
I will post the September 11, 2001 Savage Nation opening on uh, my website, michaelsavage.com, sometimes tonight. And I, I can't tell you the Fijian story last night. It's too long. All I can tell you is that there are spiritual forces in the world. I've known it my whole life. And there's another dimension or dimensions in the world. I've known that my whole life. And the years I spent in the villages in Fiji on and off, I saw it even more profoundly there. And running into these Fijian people last night in the conversation I had with them confirmed it once again, that things happen for a reason. I mean, in my life they do. They don't look like they're happening for a reason. Sometimes you don't want them to happen. And uh, you have to live with it anyway. There's a couple of, I even said this to the Fijian folks last night. I looked them in the eyes, you know, you look right in the eyes of people you really want to communicate with. It still works, incidentally. And, you know, I was smiling and I said to them, uh, I remember it's an empty restaurant, like a little nothing kind of restaurant, you know, inexpensive spaghetti joint. And I said to them, you know, the years I spent in your villages drinking Yangona, which is Kava Kava, I said I would drink it all night with the guys. And I said when, the, when there was no light in the room, my friend Dominico Coravembo, I hope he's still living, would say to them in English and Fijian, I think he's Fijian pointing at me, I was the only white man in the room, because all you saw were eyes in the circle. You know, there's a little lan lantern, and at that point it's just eyes looking at each other, and you drink Yangona or Kava Kava all night long, and certain things happen. It's a mild, mild change of your, your, psych your psyche. He'd say to them, I think he's Fijian, and they would, you know, say, yes, we think he is. So I told that to the people last night, and then one word led to the other, and I said to the woman, where are you from, what island? Because it's very important that you don't categorize people uh, any more than you do here because they're all from different places and it has a different effect upon them culturally. Uh, so she said, well, I'm from Kandavu. So I went silent because the Kandavu area, Kandavu Island, when I was in the Fiji Islands, I was kind of, I avoided it because I was told by my guides it was a very deep center of, uh, of witchcraft. And I really didn't want to mess around with it because I saw things happen to someone who traveled with me. He almost died by laughing at all of this stuff. I, I warned them not to. I said, you're in another place. You cannot take your cultural imperialism with you. I said, you know, when in Rome do as the Romans do, you better respect the Fijian customs. No, don't be ridiculous. Anyway, he almost died. I told you that story before. Uh, most unexpected way from stepping on a, on a sandy beach. He had stepped on an infected coral. They said that a, that a, ghost, a ghost bit him from one of the <laughs> graves. <laughs> That's not what happened, but... You gotta be very respectful of cultures when you're in them. And that would be my advice to our immigrants in America. See, this has a culture, America. We have our own culture. It's called borders language culture. You keep stepping on us just like the spirit that bit my friend's foot. I can guarantee you we're gonna bite you one day. We're not gonna take this forever. There will be a rising in this nation as sure as I'm standing here. I don't know who is gonna trigger it. I don't know how it's gonna be triggered. I don't know when it's gonna be triggered. This country will revolt. We're at the breaking point right now from the psychopath retrovirus that is uh, trying to destroy us. So anyway, that's a little side note. I want to keep it on a peaceful level. So we were talking and we talked about Kandavo and spirits. I happen to have had my dog Teddy with me uh, and they love dogs. They have hunting dogs in their villages very well. They understand animals. And I said, you know, I have this dog with me almost everywhere. He sleeps with me. And I said, I've always had a dog with me ever since I've been a little boy. And I said, the reason I've always had a dog with me is because they hear and see in other worlds. They looked at me and nodded, yes, of, you know, like completely. It's like, yes, of course we know that. And I said, I keep him around me because he sees and hears things from other worlds and other dimensions that we can't see. I know this is not something that rationalist conservatives can accept. Two-dimensional legalistic conservatives do not understand any of this. And that's, that's their life. This is my life. By the way, Rick Perry, who is very much like that, one of these one-dimensional conservatives, dropped out of the race today. Uh, Rick Perry suspends presidential campaign. I don't think there's anything lost here, but uh, he's gone. That's it. I'm nothing against him, nothing for him. I thought he was another George Bush, and uh, that we don't need. Anyway, we don't need him anymore. We need another, another Clinton. Period. End of story. Let's go to the callers. Line one, Robert KSFO. Tell us your story, Robert. What's up? Michael, I, I heard you talking about peace and love in the 60s today, and I was reminded at the very uh, start of my medical career in 1969, I was one of the doctors at Woodstock. Um, Unbelievable. Totally, totally by chance. And I, I remembered that of all the places I've been and seen in the world since then, it was by far 
the most peaceful and most beautiful and and it actually 